Christmas without the cross is nothing more than a pagan festival of materialism because the cross is God's Christmas tree. And he hung, hang, excuse me, he hung his son upon his Christmas tree as his expression of love and intention to save the world. And of course, the Apostle Paul, who called himself the foremost of sinners, said that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That was the purpose for which he came. So let me say it again, that Christmas without the cross is pointless. It's a pagan festival of materialism. And I want to preach to you this morning from the passage of Scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that holds Paul's testimony. But I'm going to just preach on one verse, and I want you to read that text with me. It's on the screen in front of you. It's verse number 15, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse number 15. Read it with me, please. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Did you hear what Paul said? Of whom I am the leading, the foremost, the chief of sinners, if you're reading from some of the other versions. So here is the chief of sinners, the man who in his own eyes is the foremost sinner saying, the whole reason that Jesus Christ came is to die and to save the world. Hence, Christmas without the cross has no point at all. And if you fail to worship Christ for the sacrifice that he gave and try to worship him as a babe in a manger, you've missed the whole point of Christmas. So Paul's testimony really is, let me tell you how the chief of sinners enjoys the Christmas season. How will the foremost sinner take advantage of the celebrations of the Christmas season? I want to show you, first of all, from this verse, that you have to trust the one infallible source about your salvation. Uh, you noticed, didn't you, that Paul began, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. It's interesting that the word saying there is the Greek, Greek word for logos. You've heard that word, haven't you? In John chapter 1, the Bible says that the word of God, Jesus, the logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus Christ is God's word to us. Paul is using the word saying as an extension of all of God's word. What is he telling us? Everything that God tells you is trustworthy. If God says it, you can believe it. And it ought to be fully accepted into your heart without doubt, without reservation. That's Paul's whole point. How can the chief of sinners actually take advantage of the real Christmas celebration? By planting his feet or her feet firmly upon the authority of the Bible, God's word. It's the only reliable source upon which you can build your hope, build your confidence, build your joy. It's the power of God's word. You know that Jesus himself said in John chapter 10 verse 35, the scriptures cannot be broken. Did you hear what Jesus said? Trust what I have said to you. Trust what God has said to you. That lies at the heart of being a Christian, people. Are you tracking with me this morning? I'm already dripping up here. <laughs> I have a flu bug this morning. So you're going to have to work really hard to listen to me and stay away from me afterwards. <laughs> Because I don't want to give it to you. But I'm going to pour all my energy into just reminding you this morning that you have a sacred copy of God's word in your lap. You should love it. You should learn it. And you should live it with all your might by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't always believe the word of man. David said all men are liars. Does he mean that we're all guilty of perpetually lying? No. But you can't always trust the word of man because he doesn't know all things. But you can trust God's word. Are you building your life upon the scriptures? Are they really the lamp under your feet and the light under your path? Do you have every confidence that as Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of the word will fail? I believe it and I'm standing upon it. The logos of God is his light to show sinners the way to God. You know, it's very frightening for me. The leading proponents of teaching God's people to question the Bible today 
ends up being churches and pastors all across the land. They are subverting the very authority of the Word of God. They're calling the stories of the Old Testament myths. They didn't actually happen. But you need to know if the Bible says that a man swallowed a whale, we would believe it. We believe whatever God tells us to believe in His Word. So we need to be confident. How do sinners really enjoy the celebration of Christmas? Because the Bible is the sacred record of God's plan for saving mankind. And everything he's ever said will come to pass. Let me just remind you about a few verses. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 14, Isaiah said, If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. I will grant you that there are some things that you cannot be dogmatic about. And dogmatism can be offensive. But I'm telling you that there are areas where you better be filled with conviction and boldness to stand on what God has said. You don't need to be rude about it. You don't have to be mean about it. You're not angry about it. You're happy about it. God has said it. I believe it. That settles it for me. If it's recorded in this sacred book, I'm going to trust it even if I cannot see it or feel it right now. God says it and I'm going to keep on trusting him. Um, I said to my wife the other day, I've been learning a lot from that, um, that dubious theologian, Dr. Seuss. I'm astounded at some of the great moral lessons that Dr. Seuss was able to communicate to children. Read your grandkids, Dr. Seuss, and talk to them about the great stories. One of the things that caught my attention the other day is that uh, I don't remember exactly how he said it, but he said, uh, how does a tree fall? A tree falls in whatever direction it is bending. So I would tell you, bend your faith toward the word of God and you'll never be disappointed. And if you do fall, because we all do, we will fall upon the authority of God's word. Of course, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 8, you shall, listen to me, you shall know the truth. There are people today who say, now that's arrogant. It's not arrogant, it's faith. And truth is recorded in God's word. Jesus said, thy word is truth. It's not arrogant. It's simply doing what God expects you to do. You're filled with doubts and doubts. Charles Spurgeon used to say, like wasp will sting your soul. Stop doubting the word. Doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. But don't doubt your beliefs and believe your doubts. You need to trust God's word and stand upon it. Because it is the only reliable source about your ultimate destiny and why you are here and the purpose of your life and if you start editing the stories of the Bible to fit your own mind you have destroyed your only hope of eternal life the word of the living God you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that they may know you no you mean we can know God know you the only true God And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, yeah, you can know. It's a biblical word to be able to know what God has told us. And then, of course, this is one of my favorites. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, these things are written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. When you ask someone if they know they have eternal life and they say, I think so, I hope so, maybe so, you need to show them the Bible says you can know. I would not want to die in the uncertainty that my sins are not forgiven and that I haven't been promised a home in heaven. But the Bible says you can know that your sins are forgiven. That's not on the authority of the word of a man. Churches don't have the right to grant eternal life. But Jesus said it. God's word says it. I especially like what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. Remember that text? I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him against that day. I know the one who I'm trusting in. And I'm believing in his word. Would you do me a favor, please? Wave your Bible at me. And say, this is God's word. It's always trustworthy. Now listen to me, church family. You need to be careful to build your life upon the authority of God's word. All else is sinking sand. Number two, how do sinners, even the worst ones, celebrate Christmas? They trust the one infallible source of their salvation. Number two, they believe the one person who gives eternal life. Notice the title 
that is used for Jesus in this text. He's not called Jesus Christ. He's not Jesus of Nazareth. He's Christ Jesus for a reason. His title Christ simply means basically anointed. He's the anointed one. What is he anointed to do? Listen to Isaiah's prophecy. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison doors to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. Jesus, of course, in Luke chapter 4, when he read in the synagogue, chose Isaiah 61 to declare that he was, in fact, the Messiah of Israel, the anointed one of God, who has come to do what? To bring eternal life to mankind, to forgive us of our sins. This is ident- that title Christ is identifying his divine nature. That's why Isaiah wrote in chapter 9 in verse 16, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. You know that wonderful text? He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. So the word Christ means the Anointed One. What is He anointed to do? To seek and to save those who are lost. God has especially anointed him so that he will complete the work of salvation. So how do sinners enjoy Christmas? The foremost of sinners said, by knowing the one who alone can grant eternal life. And his name is Christ Jesus. The title Christ means the anointed one and it speaks of his divinity. He is a son of God. He is the son of God. But of course he uses the term Jesus. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. That word Jesus is uh, his earthly name that was assigned to him. But Peter, preaching in Acts chapter 4, says that name is the only name by which mankind can be saved. But keep in mind that the name Jesus is a reminder to us that Jesus Christ is our elder brother. He is the one who became as we are. And according to Hebrews chapter 4, we do not have a high priest who can't feel our infirmities. He himself became a man so that when we come to him and need grace, he understands. Are you learning to do that? Jesus the Nazarene. He grew up in Nazareth. He was born in Bethlehem. He escaped to Egypt with his family. And then he was... He was raised in the small village of Nazareth. I've been to the site that has been unearthed outside of the bigger city of the modern day Nazareth. To where most historians and biblical archaeologists believe that Jesus Christ was raised. It probably was a village of no more than 800 people to 1,000 people. So it was a small community where he was raised. It was there that he experienced everything that we as human beings will experience. The highs and the lows of the earthly journey, Jesus Christ would walk through them so that one day when he was exalted to the right hand of the majesty and high, when sinners come to him and say, my heart is broken, I don't know which way to turn. We know that we're coming to a Savior who says, listen to me church family, a Savior who says, I get it, I understand what you're feeling, I have been there, I've been weary, I've been tired. I faced what you have faced. Doesn't that make him compelling to you? He's the son of God and the son of man. And all of the needs of my heart can be understood by him. How do the foremost sinners celebrate Christmas? By trusting the one infallible source of God's truth, his word. Number two, by believing in the only name... By which the forgiveness of sins can be granted. And then thirdly, accept the one miracle that proves God's love for sinners. Do you see that in the text? He came into the world. What does that mean? Listen to me, church family. God is saying to us this morning, I've proven once and for all that I love the world. By coming into the mess of this planet. 
I've told you this story before, but I learned an invaluable lesson. On Christmas Eve four years ago, we conducted my mother's funeral, and it was a blinding snowstorm. And when I say a blizzard in New Brunswick, in the Holy Land, it's a blizzard. You can't see your hand in front of your face. We all wondered if anyone could actually come through the blinding snowstorm that had struck the city of Fredericton. By the time we were ready to start the service, the chapel was full. And I remember watching as various people came through the door saying to myself, my goodness, they came. My goodness, they came. Even at risk to their own selves. That illustration pales in comparison with the trouble we were in, the mess we had made, the rebels that we were. And Jesus Christ stepped into the world to show the world that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How do I know that? Paul said in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To do what? To demonstrate his love. He came into the world the text says. That, of course, speaks of his pre-existence, doesn't it? If he came into the world, it means he existed prior to the world. He came into the world from another place. And he's the one who said, I came from above. He declared that he came from the Father. Do you remember that famous conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus? Where Jesus said in John chapter 3, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven. Who is that? That's Jesus. Just think a few chapters later in the book of John, in chapter 6, when Jesus began teaching the meat of his, his uh, truth to his disciples. And John chapter 6, every disciple of Christ should be obligated to read John chapter 6 until they get the gist of it. Jesus began teaching some hard sayings, the text says, and many of his disciples were choked at the truth of his teaching. And the power of his word. And many stopped following him. And Jesus actually said. What if you were to see the son of man. Ascending to where he was before. If you think this is hard teaching. How are you going to possibly believe. That when the son of man ascends back to the right hand of God almighty. That he is interceding for you there. You can't. What is he telling us? If you cannot believe where he came from. You can't believe what he came to do. You have to embrace the identity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That statement came into the world as a reference to his incarnation, isn't it? The incarnation affirms that the eternal Son of God took flesh from his human mother and that the historical Christ is at once both fully God and fully man. I spent several hours this past week trying to figure out the incarnation. <laughs> And it seems the more that I read, the more mysterious it becomes. But if you deny or reject the incarnation, the miracle of the word, word of God becoming flesh, you've struck a death blow to the heart of the gospel. God came into the world to seek and to save those who are lost. He came to walk with us. Listen carefully. He came the first time in fulfillment of the many Old Testament prophecies, literally thousands of them. So we wait in expectation for him to come the next time that he will appear because he promised again and again and again. Do you see what I'm saying, friends? If you can believe that he came the first time in fulfillment of all those Old Testament promises, then your greatest hope, your deepest expectation is that Jesus Christ is coming back to the earth. I've been saying to him recently, even so, come, Lord Jesus. We're going to destroy each other if you don't come soon. Have mercy upon us and return to planet Earth. We need you to intervene. I want you to establish your kingdom of peace upon the Earth because man in his best efforts will never establish peace. And the world will continue to turn in on itself. But Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. How can I trust that? How can I live day to day believing that Jesus is going to appear? Because he came the first time. And there's plenty of evidence, extra biblical evidence even, for his coming. So if he came the first time, he's going to come back the second time. And I'm going to trust him and I'm waiting for him. Are you living your life in such a way that you know you're going to face him? 
and you want that moment, you're going to do everything in your power that that moment will be filled with wonder and joy and pleasure. John says you don't want to be ashamed when he appears. What does that mean? Well, you can be ashamed when he appears because you have not followed him in obedience and love and admiration. Your heart needs to be in love with him. And if your heart is in love with him, you won't be ashamed of him when he appears. He came the first time. He's going to come the next time. And you need to be ready for him. Now, what does he say in the text? Are you still tracking with me, church family? My, you seem really quiet this morning. What's your problem? I was blown away when I walked into the church building this morning and I heard the ladies singing that song. And I thought, that's in perfect keeping with the sermon I'm going to preach. God's posture toward us is not to judge us and damn us, but to save us and give us life. That's what he wants from you this morning. And Christmas really should be a time when you reflect on how unworthy you were, but how gracious and kind God has been to snatch you from the jaws of the lion and to give you forgiveness of sins and to save you and to give you life. The, the text says Christ Jesus came into the world. What of the world? Well, the world is, according to the Bible, the domain of Satan, where he holds sinners captive. I know that. Listen, Hebrews chapter 2, the author says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he, that is Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that's the incarnation, that through death, his death at the cross. He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Jesus Christ came into the world to, to release mankind from his slavery to the enemy of his soul. Number four, let me show you from 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 15. How do the foremost sinners celebrate Christmas? By adopting the mission for which Jesus Christ came to earth. The text says, this saying is trustworthy and worthy of deserving of complete acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world. Here's the whole point of the text, to save sinners. That's why he came. His mission was assigned to him, wasn't it? In Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 21, Mary and Joseph were told, You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. His mission was assigned to him by the Father, and it was adopted uh, joyfully into his own life, because he said in Luke chapter 19, I did not come to call the righteous, but I came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's you and me. That's why he came. And then, of course, listen to me. His mission was assigned by the Father. He adopted it willingly into his own heart. But then he, he shared it with his church, didn't he? He said in Matthew chapter 28, All authority is given unto me. You go and make disciples. What is that? A disciple is someone who believes the message of the gospel. That Christ came to seek and to save those of us who are lost. Those who are lost. And so the church has adopted as its responsibility the privilege of propagating that message wherever we can. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he told us specifically that we have been made Christ's ambassadors. We stand in the place of Christ and plead with men to be reconciled to God. Why do we do that? Where do we get the authority to do that? Now listen to me. In this pluralistic society where they don't want you to, ins to assert the truth of the one-way message of Jesus, where do you get the authority to say there is only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ? You get it on the authority of Jesus himself. You're simply doing what he told you to do. You don't need your friend's permission to share Jesus with them. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think you can shove it down their throats. I think you should befriend them and earn opportunities to share Christ with them, but you make sure that you are sharing Christ with them. It's a bunch of baloney to say that Christians should just let their light shine and not use words. That's misleading. You have to use words. Because the message of the gospel cannot be communicated without words. It is the word of God that men need to hear. 
My biggest concern, though, has become that most people uh, describe the gospel in its forensic nature or in its judicial nature. What I mean by that is when they hear that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost, sinners come to him and their sins are forgiven and they leave and never think about what he has done again in their hearts. That's not at all what God's salvation is about. I think it's a very cool privilege that Jesus Christ says, you're clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. Your sins are forgiven. And you can know that as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed your iniquity from you. And he says that as the freshly fallen snow is bright and brilliant, so your sins have been forgiven. How wonderful is that? But that's just the start of the gift of God's salvation. The word actually means healing and health and wholeness. It means that salvation allows Jesus Christ access to every part of my mind, every part of my heart, the good and the bad and the ugly. And he says, I'm going to transform you from the inside out. It means that Jesus Christ has access, he has the right to demand of you that you listen to his teaching and you stop making excuses for yourself and you let him transform you into the beautiful image of who he is. Are you tracking with me, church family? You hear what I'm saying? Salvation is that on a daily basis, I get to walk with Jesus as my closest friend, the friend who sticks closer than a brother. And there are periods of time where he says, I need to talk to you about this stubborn habit in your life. I need to talk to you about this propensity to use your tongue in a critical way of others. I need to talk to you about the way your mind is bent toward dark thinking. I need to change you to be like I am in the world. That's salvation. Salvation is to live in the fullness of life. Are you living in the fullness of life? I've discovered that most sinners know when they are not. It means that you anticipate every day with great joy. It means that there is an explosive peace resident in your heart. And you are excited about the future. And you're tackling your problems with the grace and love of Jesus Christ. And you're bold. you don't know where the boldness comes from, but you have a boldness. You are bright and beautiful in the eyes of your friends because Jesus shines through your life. See, I think most people, when they hear the promise that Jesus Christ will save sinners, hear a free pass into heaven. And I'm glad I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I don't want to go to hell. I'm glad I'm going to heaven. But if that's all it is, really, are you, are you overcoming the habits and patterns of the old man that is deeply trenched, entrenched in your life? Are you still at the advanced stages of being a Christian, watching the hand of Jesus m morph your life into his very own image? Are you experiencing that from day to day? You know, one of the greatest joys for me at midlife, I thought by the time you hit 50 years of age, you'd sort of coast to heaven. <laughs> you know what I've discovered? God is more demanding of me now than he's ever been. He's relentless and ruthless with me about the excuses that I make to perpetuate the habits and sins that offend him. And it usually takes about 50 years of age for you to give up hope of changing yourself. And when you've stopped moralizing the gospel and making it something that you have to do, you finally and completely become so desperate for God that you, for, maybe for the first time in your real life, you're listening to God. You're listening to him and saying, Lord, you say I'm supposed to be this, but look at me, listen to me, listen to me every day. He says, that's exactly what I needed from you. Listen to your, just listen to yourself. Have a conversation with yourself and ask yourself, is this who I want to be in five years from now? Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm. No, you don't, honey. No, you don't want to be this in five years. How does that change? Through the marvelous grace of our loving Lord, helping you to deal with the real humanity that is still planted deep in your heart, 
and to give you a love for him and a likeness to him that is only miraculously possible. That's called grace. That's salvation. I'm not exactly sure when I was saved. As in, when my sins are forgiven. There's a record of a six-year-old boy who prayed a prayer through the Canadian Sunday School Mission in a small village in New Brunswick. His name was Derek Bartlett. He prayed a prayer. I think probably that was very real. But then, when my life was in chaos and a mess at 16 and a half, 17 years of age, I remember slipping to my knees and saying, Jesus, I, I really need you. I've made a mess of things, and I really don't have a hope in a future, and I invite you. I don't, I don't, did he save me? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm telling you that that's not the most important part of salvation. It's the door frame, if you will. It's the door seal. It's the door handle. I've opened the door. Now I'm walking through into the abundant. Are you listening to me, church family? I'm walking through the abundant life. Oh, I want for you to live the abundant life. I want you to experience the power of Jesus surging through your soul every day till you die. Don't be satisfied with anything less than the full power of God taking hold of your life. Don't be satisfied with anything less. Keep saying to Jesus, I want it. I need it. I'm serious about it. And he'll be serious about it for you. You can't coast. If you coast your you're toast. And some of you are toast because you, you've been coasting for so long. You really don't think Jesus could teach you anything more. Fact of the matter is, he doesn't lack for his ability to teach. We lack for our willingness to listen and let him change, change us. So how does he save sinners? That's easy, isn't it? Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. How does he save sinners? Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the cross. Tell them about their sin. Don't just tell them that God loved them. You have to tell them that God loved them in spite of the fact that they had sinned and they are a sinner now. But even while they were still sinners in love, Christ died for them. So what does it mean? Tim Keller puts it this way. We live around the truth of the gospel but never quite get it. So the key to spiritual renewal is the continual discovery, rediscovery of the gospel. So what does the text say? He came to save sinners. Do you mind if I just encourage you? Don't be surprised, scandalized, or scared by what pagan sinners are doing to mess up the world. They always have and they always will. We live in a broken planet. And we're called, like Christ, to live among them to love them and live with them and care for them, and above all things, share Christ with them. Christ came to save sinners. Now, my last point, fifthly and lastly, watch this now. You have to confess the one truth that stumbles most of the world. Paul declared himself the foremost sinner. I've said to you on numerous occasions, this is one text of the scripture that I'm going to argue with God about when I get to heaven. Maybe not argue with God, but argue with Paul. And say, really, Paul, you were not the foremost sinner. I was. I am. You know what caught my attention about this text this past week? It is in the present tense. Paul is not talking about himself as he used to be. He is saying, as I see myself now. That's problematic. Because he has been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. How could he see himself now as the foremost of sinners? How could this man who is so faithful to Christ to the point of death and martyrdom actually say of himself, when I look at the propensities of my dark heart, my only response is, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul saw himself at the same time as absolutely certain that his sins were forgiven and as still being the foremost of sinners. I wish I had more time to develop this for you, but I can't. I'm telling you that this is not poor psychology. The world wants to tell you that you can find your self-esteem by being a good person and find your worth and value in yourself. That's baloney. According to the gospel, that won't work. But listen to me. Paul did say, I am what I am 
by the grace of God. He had a healthy view of himself. Paul was a strong personality. He was a bold man. He was a competent man. He's the man who in Philippians chapter 3 gave a litany of his religious accomplishments that would far outweigh anything that all of us in this room would ever accomplish. But he would say, I count all that as loss that I may gain the excellency of Christ. So Paul looked at him. How could Paul on one hand see himself as the foremost sinner and completely redeemed by Christ, because that's the proper view of oneself. I am a sinner, but I have been redeemed. We possess an abiding sense of our own vulnerability along with the certainty of our salvation. Did you hear me? Foremost sinners are men and women who are prepared to be honest about who they really are. I'm pursuing Christ. I'm seeking to be obedient but I still fail in a thousand different ways. One of the things that often makes me very lonely in our church is that I don't see authentic community being pra practiced at the level it needs to be. Authentic community is when men together with men and women together with women, friends, brothers and sisters are willing to say, I'm the foremost sinner. I give you permission to know the story of my life with all of its faults and failures so that you can help me steward this journey. So that you can speak into my life. We're living in a city where people don't want relationship. And that's what's wrong with them. They're dying because nobody knows the true story of their soul. And we get to speak into each other's lives. Here's Paul, for goodness sakes. Some actually say he probably had the equivalent of four PhDs. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, but he doesn't lift himself up. What does he say? I'm the foremost sinner. You had dinner with Paul, he'd say, I can be frank with you about the horrible propens propensities of my dark heart. The things I don't want to do, I keep doing them. That's how he ended up saying, oh, wretched man that I am. He calls himself the foremost sinner. So my conclusion is simply that sinners, according to this text, are both loved unconditionally and transformed faithfully by Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Can we take a very quiet moment before the Lord, our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I preached today why Christ came. Why did Jesus come to the earth? It's an important question for Christmas time, isn't it? This text couldn't be plainer. He came to save sinners. Are you here this morning and you have never trusted him? You have not been saved? Would you open your heart to him today? Would you say, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner. I admit to you that I have sinned. I am a sinner. But I believe that you are the Savior of the world, and I invite you into my heart. I trust you. That's why he came. Open your heart to him. And then those of us who have trusted him, let's share that message with as many people as we can this Christmas season. Father, we bless you and praise you for the magnificent gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and for all that it means to us. And I pray that you would use this message to stir in us a passion for Jesus like we've never had before, and a desire to go the distance with him and to follow him, even into the abundant life, not just to receive from him the forgiveness of sins, but to receive from him that abundant life that he promised to give us through the power of the gospel. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.